yeah, perfect recording. Um, yeah, so hi everyone and welcome to today's ODI Friday's lunchtime lecture. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome um, Doug Specht and Monica Halcourt um, to, to the talk today. Um, they're going to be talking about um, the book Mapping Crisis and looking at how um, data can be used in times of crisis and the ethical discussion around that. Um, so just to remind everyone, we are recording this talk for our YouTube channel. Um, please do keep your mic and video switched off for the, for the duration of the talk. Um, if you have questions, um, you can submit them via the chat function. Um, and then once Doug and Monica have finished talking, I'll kind of... Um, draw on people to, to ask their questions um, and you're welcome to unmute and ask them yourself or I can also ask them for you. Um, so I think that's it for me. So I will mute and hand over to, to Doug first for a quick introduction. Sure, let me just uh, share this slide here for you. Hopefully you can see that all okay now. Uh, so yes, th firstly, thank you very much for, for having us. Uh, Wonderful to be able to, to come and speak at the Open Data Institute. I've long admired your work and uh, delighted to be able to speak here today on my birthday, which uh, what better way to spend your birthday than at the ODI, that's what I say. Um, so I, I'm just gonna give, to start by by giving a little bit of an overview of, of some of the thinking behind behind this book that, that uh, uh, Monica was one of the, the contributors to, along with, with many other uh, scholars and, and practitioners in, in humanitarianism. Um, and give a, a little bit of a flavor about what we were trying to achieve with it in terms of, of what issues we saw, what issues we, we think are, you know, are being addressed but not really quite getting there and, and perhaps just give a hint as to what the future might, might look like. Um, and then, then I'll hand over to Monica who's gonna to share some, some really good, strong uh, sort of empirical work and, and ideas that, that she has. Um, so I, I want to sort of start by thinking about what the classical ethical issues are. And I don't think anything I'm about to say here is, is anything new or interesting perhaps to, to an audience for, for the ODI. It's the kind of issues we, we think about a lot, but it's, it's really important that we go back to those fundamentals in order to be able to, to contextualize what, what we're doing. So we know that there are lots and lots of issues in relation to data. Um, we know that we suffer from dark data um, where we don't collect certain types of data, whether that's because it's, it's difficult to collect or because we epistemologically or ideologically don't think that it's an important thing to collect or, or we perhaps don't even imagine that it might need collecting. And this kind of data uh, often affects children um, particularly, uh, especially when we're talking about digital data. It, it affects people who have knowledge systems that don't conform to the way that Western conceptualizations of data work. So if we, we can't conceptualize time or, or place in the same way as other people's, it, it's very hard for us to, to quantify that. And so rather than working with people, we sometimes just ignore that data set. Um, increasingly, those without a mobile phone disappear from our data sets as well. And, and we know that all of these problems exist. We also know that we have issues of data washing. We know that visualization techniques often obscure or mask the story that we're trying to tell. And I think COVID has, has shown us, you know, just how much this pervades our every day. You know, people who perhaps were never interested in data before are now becoming, you know, amateur experts in, in uh, you know, an oxymoron, but an, an amateur experts in data and data visualization as people are starting to pour over graphs and maps and, and things in a way they haven't done before. And this kind of thing of, of skewing our axes on, on uh, graphs is something that I think people are much more aware of now in terms of, of how we wash data. We're also aware, uh, you know, that we have this idea of, of data positivism, where we end up with so much data or such complex data, we, we have to sort of bring it down to something quite uh, overly simplified. And in doing that, lots of assumptions are brought in about what should be included, what shouldn't be included. And all of these perspectives and ideologies become mixed up and we present something that appears as a neutral uh, tool or a neutral set of data masking um, that ideology that might be hidden in it. And we, we know all of these things. And for many, many years, we've been looking at, at the solutions for this um, as humanitarians, uh, as data practitioners, uh, uh, as cartographers, we, we've been looking for solutions. And 
we've come up with, I guess, a, a, a selection of frameworks and ideas that that remind us about what we need to do better. So we often think about visualizations and, and there's this very sort of well-trodden idea that no visualization is neutral. Um, and I think, you know, that's very true and it's something that we're quite aware of. I think sometimes we're not as aware of, of just how delicate that balance around visualization is. Um, for example, something like Google Maps, who between 2010 and 2016 massively changed the way that they display data on their maps. And this sort of happened slowly over time and uh, perhaps not to anyone's sort of consciousness. But what we see is that Google now puts a lot more priority on road systems than it does on places. And in doing this, we might argue that they're, they're eroding the existence of people who live in certain towns, that they're promoting uh, the idea that we need transport infrastructures and particularly road infrastructure rather than, um, than public transport infrastructure. And so this map changes our relationship with the society that we live in. Um, to use a, another sort of quite similar example, I was doing some work in, in uh, the West Bank a few years ago and passing through Tel Aviv, we were looking for restaurants and we found that depending on whether we were searching in Hebrew or Arabic, we were directed to very different parts of Tel Aviv to go and have our dinner. And here, the, the visualization of, of restaurants and the platform just using the language that you've chosen isn't a neutral thing. It's not just telling me the best place to go and have dinner. It's actually starting to ghettoize or continuing the ghettoization of Tel Aviv by sending certain populations to certain parts of town for dinner. <laughs> So, so we know that those visualizations aren't neutral. I think we, we sometimes are easily lured into uh, you know, feeling like we might be doing better than we are with this and, and skipping some of that uh, relationship with our everyday lived experience. We also work on this concept that, that perspectives are partial. And th this is something that I think has become much more important and much more talked about since we you know started talking about the idea of the big data age we know that it doesn't matter how much data we're collecting we will never be able to to truly represent what's happening um, but we're more often becoming lured into thinking that we have a complete perspective on something because of the larger data sets we collect um, or mixing data sets together um, but I think it comes down to, and this is sort of a, a question that gets asked in the book quite a lot, is have we got the data that we need to be able to answer this humanitarian issue or this crisis moment or, or whatever it is? Or are we using the data that we have and we've lured ourselves into thinking that we actually have the data that we need? And I think the third thing that we, we're very aware of and we're working towards addressing um, and that comes up in the book a, a huge amount is this idea that platforms have politics, that they're, they're hugely political. Um, and that might seem quite obvious in places like, you know, Facebook. I think, you know, that feels like it's a very political platform, but it goes beyond this. All of our platforms are created through a political ideology that we have a way of understanding the world around us and when we create a platform for data sharing, for data exchange, for presenting data, for discussion, that ideology is baked deeply into it. And, you know, we, we see uh, bizarre things like the AI for Good Global Summit inviting the uh, former CDO of Cambridge Analytica to speak. And this is after the Cambridge Analytica scandal had broken, but still, OK, we've got on a panel about artificial intelligence for good. There's politics baked in there about who gets to speak and who's speaking on what platforms and about uh, the platforms that we're using technologically as well. So what does this actually mean for the future? Um, and this is where the book is really targeted. We really want to know what can we, what can we do better? You know, why is a lot of that not good enough? And I'm just gonna give a couple of brief points on this before I hand over to Monica. Firstly, I think that this is hugely important. Um, we often talk about fixing a lot of these problems by educating the population better. Um, and it, it's not just about data, but we talk about this in terms of social media. We talk about this in terms of, of media literacy. 
this idea that if the if the population can read this data better, if the population can understand the biases in social media, etc., then these problems will be solved. But I don't think, um, as this quote also uh, attests to, this is not fair. This is putting the burden of having to solve the world's issues on the people who are having them inflicted upon them. And I use this example, how do you teach someone that the it's perfectly okay or that they just have to accept or that they need to understand or that it's their fault that a soap dispenser has been trained on data that then can't read the hands of non-Caucasian people and doesn't dispense some soap. That's not something we can educate out of uh, our data bias and our political platforms. That's something that needs to be addressed at the at the production stage of designing these platforms and, and systems. So we need to understand this is the core, and I think this is what runs through every chapter of the book. You know that the biases are a social problem, and the, all of these biases that come into data, it's about the the bias in our data reflecting the biases in society. But that we also need to be incredibly aware that by trying to fix the gap by for perhaps deciding, okay, let's collect more data about this underrepresented group of people, what we actually do is we become the tools of the surveillance state and we start classifying and surveilling these people in order, or these groups of people, in order to fill our data sets. And that becomes just as political and just as biased as it ever was. Which leads us then to two, two quotes that really, um, I think, epitomize what this book is, is struggling to, to answer and it was trying to put forward answers to. Firstly, you know, is, is a, a quote for all time. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. How, you know, can we use these same digital tools that are baked in with the same digital biases of society to actually deconstruct those? That's a, that's a really fundamental question and one to keep in mind. And the second is a question that in development studies has been asked for since 1979 and, and certainly before that as well, but, but famously by Chambers in 1979, whose knowledge actually counts in all of this? And we need to think back to that question there as well. These are all the kind of questions that we're, we're challenging and, and, and asking in the book, but I'm, I'm gonna hand over to, to Monica now to uh, share some of her insights and uh, ideas from the specific work that she's been doing. Thank you, Doug. Okay, let me just hit. Oh. Can you see my presentation now? Uh, not yet. Mm -hmm. Just one second, sorry. Can you see it now? No. No, why has it disappeared? Hmm. Let me try it one more time. No? I'm afraid not. I have hit the, the share it button. It? It's Oh, well, it just worked before. Sure. Oh, yeah, oh, we yeah, we've yes. got it now. Yeah. Now, we, now we have you. We just need okay. to uh, put it into presentation mode in PowerPoint. No, it was an option in the in the uh, Zoom thing. Sorry about this. Okay, so uh, my specific contribution, the chapter that I contributed to the book, it really forms part of a wider project uh, in which I explore or I'm very much interested in the relationship between contemporary data infrastructures and uh, colonial knowledge regimes. And what interests me here in particular are the kinds of relations digital infrastructures create, how they configure individuals and populations in relation to market and the state. As many of you know, I'm sure the reference of colonialism has of course gained significant traction in the discourses on data power. But most of these accounts focus very much on the extractive logic of data relations, the ways in which digital infrastructures appropriate and exploit social activities for the sake of value creation and profit, and how they conscript even the most mundane aspects of everyday life in the service of capital. 
And while such critiques are certainly important and uh, point out the important continuities in the entanglement of datafication, dispossession, and enclosure, I think we need to look beyond the political, political economy um, when trying to understand the particular kind of violences that are inherent in data relations. And that means uh, extending our view beyond logics of extractions to see how data actually constructs objects and bodies as legal and political subjects. And this is what I'm trying to do in my work. And I'm drawing here very much on intersectional analysis, which allows for a more nuanced analysis of data power, uh, because it allows us to distinguish between the former beneficiaries uh, of colonialism and those on the receiving end. And uh, the specific context in which I discussed this is the context of irregular migration in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. And now my main argument here is that the oppressive force of data relations is not reducible to ex extraction and enclosure, but rather it needs to be understood through the ways data configures ethical, what I call ethical political substance as a new underclass of data fight subjects. The, I call them digital subalterns that are kept outside the political and symbolic order. Now, intersectional analysis, just a brief recourse, is interested in how apparently value-free bureaucratic processes such as counting and mapping and data extractions redistribute violence unevenly across populations, amplifying possible harms for those who are already targeted at multiple levels at once. In the context of digital mapping, that means interrogating how the targeted exclusions and power asymmetries, questions of race, gender, age, are amplified and reformulated or re reproduced by digital infrastructures and how they diffract these racializing logics across socio-technical domains. And in the specific context of migration, that means looking not just at the, at the access of data that is collected, but in my case, looking at what is left out, the violence of non-datafication, how certain kinds of bodies are left outside the big data frame. The Mediterranean, um, as many of you know, is one of the most policed seascapes in the world and arguably one of the best mapped crises in humanitarian history. The main agencies involved here are the border security Frontex, but also various civil society activists, such as Médecins Frontières, Sea Watch, Alarm Phone, and Watch the Mat. All of these groups use automatic, aut automated shipping track, tra ship tracking technologies, satellite phones, surveillance drones, satellite imaging to monitor irregular migrants across the sea. And what is striking and paradox is indeed that despite all this excessive mapping and, and surveillance activity, we have little accurate and, 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 and reliable data available on those who die or go missing. All we are left with are best guesses uh, and rough estimates provided by the International Organization of Migration and of course the data of the activists, but all those rely on eyewitness reports uh, which are situational and really dependent upon circumstance. It's important to note that Frontex, the leading border security agency, doesn't keep track of how many die or disappear on their way to Europe. It has, in fact, no interest in the dead and missing, but focuses mainly on the, mainly on the living, those who continue to pose an acute threat in its border regime. For civil society activists, on the other hand, counting the dead has become an important strategy to expose this very violence of securitization and border policing in order to hold European states to account. They keep a daily record of all reported deaths, compiling them into various lists and maps. But like I said, based on interviews with survivors of shipwrecks, media reports, and information provided by med medical examiners. These maps are then used for public demonstrations uh, and in part have been successful, of course. They managed to disrupt the wall of silence around the human cost of border policing, and that has enabled Euro European states really to evade responsibility for migrant death. But the, the, these maps also established the dead, and migrant, the dead migrant body as a key battleground, I argue in my book chapter, between activists and border security uh, and European states. The activists themselves, of course, take great pride in their subversive, subversive use of data infrastructures. They describe it as a form of epistemic dis disobedience capable of turning the surveillance gaze of the state against itself. 
And I have no intention, of course, to question these ambitions, but I argue that these, that these death maps nonetheless end up simply mirroring the objectifying gaze of the state and its security apparatus in so far as they read the migrant body from the same disembodied, disembodied view of nowhere as Frontex and local coast guards, leaving the migrant's own partial perspective invisible and foreclosed. What's more, by recording migrant death primarily on the basis of their last known geolocation, the activists, just like Frontex, spatialize death in ways that reify the territoriality of the current geopolitical order um, that reads the embodied substance of the dead and missing migrant solely in relation to the state and the expansive geography of the border, while their relational entanglement and affective presence in the, in the hearts and minds of their families and relatives are ignored. What is lost on the way, therefore, I argue, is the potential to rewrite the map from the viewpoint of the dead and the missing, from the migrant body itself not as a fixed or bounded essence or location, but as a multiplicity, as a scattered and diffracted presence stretched across various spatial, temporal and affective domains. This critical gap is further amplified by the fact that the receiving states, once a body washes up on the shore, hardly ever conducts forensic investigations. Only a fraction of the corpses that are found receive a proper autopsy that includes DNA samples that would allow for their later identification should relatives start looking for their, for their missings. And even in the rare cases where such samples are collected, it's done very unsystematically and in disorganized ways. And so I'm drawing two main conclusions from this. The ever more pervasive datafication of irregular migration has, produ has produced a striking imbalance between the level of detail and amount of data collected for the purpose of surveillance and securitization and the quality and depth of knowledge we have uh, generated through a careful e examination of the individual migrant body above and below sea grounds. This discrepancy not only disintegrates the dead and missing body into a scattered assemblage of data fragments, it has left the dead and missing by and large unreadable and unrecognizable, both as historical subjects, but also as a subject of legal and moral protection and care. The structural ab abandonment of drowned corpses and dead and missing is not a systematic glitch, and it's also not reducible to inefficiency or lack of funds. In my view, it, re it reveals a new phase of racialization of subalternity and erasure that is peculiar to data regimes. It has locked the dead and missing migrants in an ambivalent state of an absent presence, an empty variable that powerfully evokes Spivak's notion of the subaltern, the one placed outside the symbolic order, defined above all by its inability to speak. Subalternity, it's worth remembering, is not the, uh, is not the incapacity of, uh, of, of speech itself, it's a failure of speech, the inability to register one's voice within a surplus of reason that has always already laid out the terms and conditions of speech in advance. Relate back to the specific context of digital speech, that means this denial and enunciation of enunciation in mapping is not reducible to discourse or targeted exclusion on the level of populism or ideology. Rather, it emerges from the way, from the non-linear transition of the facticity of the body into and out of, the, out of data that constitutes subjectivities through the flexible designation of human and non-human substance in the specificity of muteness and inaudibility in as efforts. And I think I'll leave it at this and hopefully have provoked a lot of clarifying questions. Sorry, I had to read this, but, but uh, it's, it turns out to be better not to lose my line of thought uh, uh, in the course of speech. And now I end, start and uh, uh, Yeah, see, Monica, so if you just yeah, stop sharing your screen as well. Okay. If you can. Stop share, okay. 
Great, thank you. Uh, thanks both. Um, so we haven't got any questions in the chat so far. I would encourage people to yeah drop drop questions in if you have them, um, or I'll just I'll just kind of give it a minute um, for for people to to speak up out loud if they if they do want to kind of ask questions live. Uh, okay. Perhaps, Doug, I can kind of hand back to you if you wanted to expand. <laughs> yes, Neil, we probably are. Um, yeah, if you wanted to expand, because I know you kind of were only able to give a kind of brief intro to the to the book before. So if you wanted to kind of expand on that, um, and we that'll that'll give people a bit of a, a bit more of an opportunity to to ask questions if they have any. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, very happy to. Um, and thanks, Monica, for for your talk and uh, hugely interesting as always. Um, I, I won't bombard anyone with any more uh, s s pieces of information to stun you um, so that you can uh, think about your questions. Um, although I see, see uh, Neil asking something and I was just about to come to. Um, you, you can get the book on Amazon, but actually, uh, I think one of the I'm going to hold up a copy now because I'm contractually obliged to. But one of the things that's, that was really important in putting together this book was that, you know, we're talking about who is this information for and who who should have access to these things. And it would be be wrong of us to have published a book that then is unaffordable for people. So the book's actually also open, uh, open access. Um, so you can download it and read it for free if you wish, if you want to have one on your shelf, you're very welcome to. But we wanted to make sure that, you know, these really important conversations that are about you know, a great range of people, everybody from from the migrants, as Monica's talking about, to um, people who've been working in refugee camps in, in Uganda, to forest fi uh, fighting forest fires in, in rural Russia. There's a whole spectrum. Um, but a lot of the communities that are included and, and discussed in the book uh, are perhaps not in a position to be able to go and spend I think it's £23.99 or whatever it is on a book. So it was really important to us to also make that uh, open access and to be able to, to share these thoughts because it, it's not just about, uh, you know, it's, it's a reasonably academic book, but it's not just about us saying, okay, these, these are the problems, but it's about saying, here's our, how, our thoughts about some of the solutions. Um, and, the, you know, the, there's multiple other chapters in there that take us through a lot of different case studies from all parts of the world and, and look at all of those themes that I was I was talking about at the beginning, but find a, a, a whole range of different potential solutions, um, and perhaps even more than that, uh, a whole range of questions that we should be asking ourselves while we're doing this work. That that makes what we do, what we research, and what we what we question and think about that makes that much much stronger um, and I think that's the the real importance uh, for us here and and so uh, yeah great question can you get it on Amazon um, you can but you don't need to you can uh, you can get it somewhere else as well uh, if you like um, I could talk a little bit more or there are uh, I don't want to just talk over people who may be wanting to ask questions Yeah, I can't see any indication that people no. that people do at the moment. Um, I do a lot of teaching online. I, I, when I trained to be a teacher, they said you should wait at least 30 seconds for the students to put their hands up. Online, it seems to be about 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so so I've, I've, I've got, got quite good at dramatic, dramatic pauses. Um, Actually, yeah. we have sorry, we have just had one question in the chat, another one from, from Neil, um, asking if you could tell us a bit more about the, the contents. Of I the, can of the tell book. you a little bit more about the, the contents. So I think what's interesting about this, this book, I mean, I do think it's interesting, obviously, I'm biased in, in that, but we started this book quite some time before, uh, before COVID was an everyday word. And um, the, the book starts with a foreword called uh, Mapping Crisis, a Reflection on COVID-19. And, and I think something that might, might sort of really appeal to, to people at the moment is that although we've got uh, 12 chapters of, of different case studies around the world, they're, they're actually in some ways, they're all linked together by a, a situation that is now on all of our doorsteps. So when we were writing this book, we were writing these chapters that were very much about 
issues that were happening in, in different parts of the world. And most of these issues, to those people who aren't, aren't studying them, aren't involved in them, are, are incredibly remote and incredibly distant. You're, you're, you know, the, the lay person, for want of a better term, does not classically spend a large amount of time thinking about data, data ethics, the interaction of data and the, the everyday lived experience. And we were writing that book in that vein. Um, and just before we, we published it, the publishers said, oh, well, Anset, what about COVID? And we, we decided not to change the whole book. But what we realized was that, that while the, the contents of the book cover um, everything from colonial gazes, participatory mapping, um, data colonialism and, and uh, drones, uh, Monica's work on migration and mapping, refugee spaces, uh, refugee work in, in Uganda, uh, citizen science in, in Slovenia and firefighting in Russia, a really broad spectrum. But suddenly all of these stories are connected to so many more people's lives. As, as I was saying in that introduction, this idea that suddenly we're concerned about the data-driven uh, existence that we all find ourselves in. Uh, in the COVID era. Is it called an era yet? Probably not, but it will be. Um, and so suddenly there's this relevance and this fear for a general population and, a, and questioning about data. But this is not new. This, this has been the lived experience of, of tens of thousands, millions of people, but we often haven't really cared what our data is doing to those people. We, we, haven't really noticed whether we're doing it right. We might have fudged the edges, and, I, and I'm using we in a, in a hugely broad sense here. I don't mean anyone on this call necessarily or anything like that, but just the, the notion of, of data-driven humanitarianism, data-driven development was very othering. It's now been really brought home to us. And I, and I think the, the stories in the book, um, and I think they are stories because they're all about people really, are now something that feels very familiar to us. And I think by now engaging with the, these other stories through this lens of, of, oh, this is now me, that I'm now being, my children are going to school or not based on data, but I don't know how that data is collected. Well, we've been doing that for refugees for uh, you know, a hugely long time. We've been doing that in moments of crisis in other places and, and projecting that around the world. Now it's, now it's home to roost. Uh, the, the book actually became more salient than we perhaps had even, even imagined it, it could be at that time, which um, is not to be delighted that, uh, that COVID happened, but it, it, it's serendipitous, perhaps. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Monica, a little bit. Or... Yeah, and I think what COVID also brought out is, is one of the things I'm very much concerned about is how we think this relationship between data and the individual body and the collective body for that matter, the body of society. I think what COVID really brought home to people is that you are your data. There is no way of distinguishing your physical presence, embodied being in the world from your data, which kind of really brings this whole question of ownership, profit making for one to the four, but also the profound power uh, that it has and, and, and the very existential questions to which um, data is, is connected. And for the first time, the migrant and the citizen are in the same position uh, with regards to facing the very real possibility of death. Uh, and, and, and to experience this, this in the context of massive data collection, I think is profoundly uh, problematic, but also very helpful in kind of sharpening or developing a, a, a much more sensibility to the ontological dimension of data. Uh, at least that's what I would hope for and, and, and continue to work on, because I think this is a unique moment uh, where everyone in, 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 in their tiny little corner starts to realize that, that I think we have to seize this moment uh, as people who have been working on these issues for a long time and really try to, to, to uh, put it forward. But of course, it's tremendously difficult as we've seen with the tracing apps, for instance. And I think that brings me to another point. Uh, data is one thing, but the real-time element of traceability is equally important uh, uh, in terms of an infrastructural problem uh, to include in this debate because it's no longer just uh, data in the end is, is, is always already this end product, another object and easily then turned. And what makes it so 
easy to 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 take it away from you is precisely because it can be physically in that sense separated from you traceability becomes a whole other matter it's not even about visibility or, or invisibility it's about recognition and presence and the possibility to participate uh, and 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 be recognized as as part of of a society or having the freedom and autonomy um, to decide the degrees to which you are recognized as such yeah absolutely i think it's it's brought so much into focus um covid uh, that that there is it is a is a pivotal moment um if we have the energy because i think covid is also making us all quite tired but uh, but if we have the energy to to do that it's a it's a real pivotal moment um just picking up on on neil's question in the in the chat there about uh the impact of climate change in the UK. There's nothing explicit in this book about climate change and the the UK context, um, but there there is discussion around data and, and climate. It's it's not a focus of this this book, which you know you might think well it should perhaps have been more of a focus of this book. But with, there's so many humanitarian uh, narratives that that could be explored, and that that wasn't one that the direction that we went down with this particular volume. But there is. Uh, a lot of discussion around um, participatory citizen science, participatory mapping methods, um, the, the chapter that, that looks at forest fires in Russia is also looking at the way that citizens are, are mapping and constructing ideas around how climate relates to these forest fires which are often ignored or left to burn because acknowledging those fires means acknowledging that there's more fires every year and that means acknowledging that climate change might be a thing so, th so there's a lot of narratives that we could link to climate change and there's, there's certainly a lot of narratives that could link to to climate change in the uk and the way that we present that kind of data um, and what that that does for people and climate change is is certainly uh if not already is is very close to being the primary humanitarian issue um you know we, we do still have conflicts and, and other uh, causes of humanitarian crisis but but climate is is accelerating so fast to being that that primary thing that i think that all of these narratives about the way that we talk to people we work with people about data becoming uh you know acute in in multiple types of of crisis um so if you're looking specifically for climate change in the UK, you might be a little bit disappointed. If you're, if you're reading more broadly about how these narratives around climate, the interaction between that kind of climate data, people, the representation of people and their own uh, ability to, to, to move, migrate or mitigate climate change, then, then you will find plenty of that uh, in, the, in the book as well. And climate has also been, uh, it, it's highly published. So I think it was important to shift the focus uh, in, into a different direction. But I think what, what will be interesting looking ahead is really how we may think about participatory practices and citizen science in relation to COVID. Um, I haven't yet come up with, uh, and I actually haven't really seen uh, any striking examples, but, but coming back to the inseparability of subjects and data and, and the sensitive issues involved, I think it will be very interesting to see uh, what comes out in this field. Uh, uh, and, and maybe it will be our next book. <laughs> uh, because I think collecting experiences from different parts of the world, I mean, uh, I've just, uh, I was forced out of Lebanon, so to speak. Uh, looking at the at the discrepancy again in data situations even india lebanon the arab countries uh in in themselves deeply split egypt um it's it's astonishing how a global pandemic can can still at this age uh still have such discrepancies not just in vaccines but also data and, and tracing capabilities when it comes to fighting uh, uh, a disease like that and very much will depend on citizen science that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, I, I haven't seen any particular citizen science projects around COVID myself either either yet. Um, Neil's also asking about uh, citizen science projects related to flooding and, and incinerators. Uh, I mean, uh, slightly slightly off this this topic, and I'm not sure, but you might. Um, I wonder whether UCL's Extreme Science Lab is doing any of that kind of work at the moment. They might be someone to have a, a look at, but I. 
I don't know off the top of my head about citizen science on flooding and incinerators in the UK or anywhere actually incinerators is very far outside of my field of expertise I'm afraid <laughs> Uh, great. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, we can perhaps draw to a to a close. Um, again, I'll just I'll just give a few more seconds, um, just in case anyone does want to um, just want to speak up and ask anything. No. Uh, great. Well, thank you again to Doug and Monica. That was a really insightful. Um, kind of presentation and discussion and um, so yeah thank you again and thanks everyone else for for joining um, and enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend thank, thank you. you very much thanks for having us thank you bye bye <laughs>